It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Carl Gaffney from Norwich, a consultant rheumatologist who was uh, the senior author of the recent revision of the BSR guidance on ankylosing spondylitis. Um, Dr. Gaffney, this was a, an update essentially. Essentially an uh, update, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right, from the 2005 guideline and, uh, and a lot has happened in this uh, field, right? Yeah. And so I wonder whether you could um, just um, discuss and explain what the key changes of the recent uh, guidance are compared to the 2005 one. Yeah, I think yep, there's been huge advances in this disease area in the last yeah. 10 years. Uh, in relation to availability of new TNF inhibitors, mm -hmm. new license indications, and uh, we're now able to treat patients with both radiographic, as in ankylosing spondylitis, and non-radiographic disease. Mm -hmm. And this guideline basically informed those changes and mm -hmm. has created a standard or a structure around which patients can provide optimum care for patients. So not only can a wider range of treatment mm -hmm. patients access treatment, mm -hmm. but we also have the opportunity to switch therapies in patients who've had an inadequate response to the first TNF inhibitor, and that wasn't available before. Right. So it's very exciting. Yes, yes. So, um, and, and, and uh, I just wonder whether NICE has changed its view on, on treating these patients on the basis of this guidance? Well, we'd like to think that the guidance has perhaps informed NICE, yeah. um, and certainly many of the authors of this guideline were yeah. involved in the NICE appraisal process. Right. So whether indirectly or directly, I think we've exerted some influence on yes, NICE, so yeah. that's, that's something we're yes, very pleased yeah. about. Right. And how do these um, guidelines um, compare to the EULA guidelines? I think very, very similar right. um, in terms of eligibility. Um, there aren't really any significant differences that really impact on clinical care. I think in the, in the UK, um, these guidelines will be considered to be quite liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's something that we've really uh, fought for. And, but it's evidence-based and, and, and it's best practice, so, so we're very pleased about that. Right. So, so what are the uh, remaining areas of uh, controversy in, in this field? I think there are some concerns about the definition of axial spondylar arthritis, particularly the non-radiographic group. Right. Um, and I think in terms of imaging, there are still some controversies around the interpretation of MRI scans. So that's something that will need to be addressed. But I think more importantly than that, and something that this guidance doesn't really address, and it's not within its remit, is the whole issue about delay to diagnosis. Right. Um, there are so many patients out there with this disease who yeah. either don't know they have it or are not able to access the optimum care. Yeah. So that's probably one of the big challenges. Mm. Um, the other, I wouldn't say deficiency, but the other area that we need to address is the whole issue of IL-17 inhibitors, mm -hmm. which weren't licensed at the time this guideline was prepared, but that mm -hmm. needs to be considered, and, and I'm sure will be at, at, at a stage in the near future. Right. Okay, well, that was a, a short description and a summary of this, uh, these changes, and um, I'd like to thank you for um, coming oh, very and explaining these changes, and I look forward to um, you know, further work in this field, so um, thank you very much. Thank you.